or some of the numbers you hear that, you know, people in the industry suggest that the average collective in Division One has raised somewhere between three and five million dollars. On the high end, it's maybe 10 plus million. And, and that's great for year one, right, where these are brand new organizations. Uh, the schools can now support them more directly as far as promotion and publicity, thanks to the latest NCAA guidance. But what will that look like in year two? This what? is Beyond the Ball, where we help student athletes succeed beyond their degree. What's going on? What's going on? What's going on, ballers? And welcome to another episode of Beyond the Ball. And I'm excited because, as you all know, every time we get the opportunity to help student athletes succeed beyond their degree, then that's what we do. We have another exciting guest, and we're going to go ahead and dive in. I have I have Mr. Andy Witchery, and Andy, you know, he talks NIL. He's a sports business reporter on Three Sports. Andy, how are we doing today? I'm doing great, Jonathan. Thank you so much for having me. Definitely, man. Glad, glad, glad to have you. Glad to have you. Glad for us to get the opportunity to, you know, have this conversation. But before before we even go anywhere, I, I just have to ask you: Do did you expect NIL to do what it's doing? Yes and no. That's a complex question. Had to kind of stop there and think about that for a minute. I would say that the the way that it's taken off, um, as far as the collective landscape, I think that that's one where. I don't know if I saw that extent, that scope coming, where collectives are these groups of donors that are pooling their money and creating organizations, maybe nonprofits, maybe LLCs, maybe marketing agencies, and they're finding ways for student athletes to profit, or they're just you know pooling donations and contributions and then paying these athletes directly. And I think that that way is that um, there's almost a blending of their true marketing value as far as sponsorships and, and marketing deals. And then there's what, you know, at on three, we call the roster value, right? Where Patrick Mahomes has both his NFL salary and his outside endorsements. And with NIL, that line is kind of blurred oftentimes, which more power to the athletes. That's the, the power that they have uh, given their platforms and their positions in their schools. But I think that the degree to which these groups have formed and set up a strong infrastructure to uh, arrange deals, to, to fundraise, I'm not sure that I saw that coming. Um, but I think that in other ways, it, it was predictable in, in certain like realms of this landscape where we're seeing female athletes crush it. A lot of the deals just in general are on social media. So in, in some ways, things are going to be easy to project. But as far as maybe the scale and the numbers that get thrown out there, um, maybe that is sometimes surprising too. Yeah, because for, for me, right, like I've, I've gone to the websites and it probably, it probably was look, looking at, you know, looking at a, a blog or something that you've put out because it's all this nil content and you know we all have to learn because it, it, it's one of those things to where it seems like something so simple but at the same time uh, deeper than the surface is very complex right so i've seen all these collectives and seen all of what's going on and even multiple collectives for one or two or three you know for a couple of institutions so the reason I want to I want to ask you that is because personally, do you do you think the collective, like the collective landscape, will continue to be able to last, or do you think like they're going to start getting shut down? Do you think you know there's going to be some legal implications that that happens there? What 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 are your what are your thoughts, Andy? I want to hear your thoughts. <laughs> I do think that the landscape itself will stick around. Now, the individual collectives within that, I think we'll see a lot of consolidation. We've already seen, I think, there's at least four or five instances where some have merged at different schools. Uh, Florida State, TCU, Virginia Tech, just to name a handful. Uh, Georgia Tech, I believe, just this past week. So I do think that there's a sustainability component that either a lot aren't um, capable of handling or have not thought through far enough in advance to figure out how do we uh, retain these funds year after year, where some of the numbers you hear that, you know, people in the industry suggest that the average collective in Division One has raised somewhere between three and $5 million. On the high end, it's maybe 10 plus million. And, and that's great for year one, right, where these are brand new organizations. Uh, the schools can now support them more directly as far as promotion and publicity, thanks to the latest NCAA guidance. But what will that look like in year two? What about year three? So as far as, you know, the current transfer portal window in college football where lots of numbers are being thrown out and it's almost the college version of free agency, in some ways I'm almost more intrigued for this time next year uh, for football and as well as the next basketball offseason 
because that's when you find out, okay, how sustainable is this? Or it's not a one-time thing. Do you have the business community involved? Do you have ways that the fans who are giving 10 bucks a month or 25 bucks a month, do they feel the value and not just the on-court or on-field value as far as wins or, hey, we think that we're recruiting better because of this, but do you feel a connection to the players? Is there some sort of meet and greet or tailgate that lets you meet the starting point guard or the starting quarterback? Or is there an exclusive podcast or content that you think is worth that 10 bucks a month or 25 bucks a month? So I think a lot of these collectives won't be sustainable. And that's why you'll see mergers. There are several third-party companies that provide the backing and the infrastructure to kind of run the behind-the-scenes operations. And they have people that are maybe alums or, or local business members that they're the ones kind of on the ground in that college town kind of running the operations um, you know, on, on campus, if you will. And so the, the ones that don't have that infrastructure you know, might fold. They might merge. So I do think the landscape as a whole We'll stick around for however long this current era within the NIL era lasts as far as collectives and kind of that blurring of the line of, of true marketing deals versus more of the, like the roster value deals. As long as we're in this era, there will be collectives, but from school to school and in conference to conference, I, I think those numbers might fluctuate actually quite a bit in the next year. Okay. Okay. You threw out the term transfer portal. Okay. You said transfer portal. So I have to... Because I've been just curious um, with, you know, with the with the transfer portal and seeing the amazing or the, well, yes, of course, they're, you know, they're, they're amazing athletes, they're amazing students that are hopping in the transfer portal, but they're hopping in by the droves. What are, what are your thoughts about the transfer portal, Andy? What are your thoughts? I think it's awesome. I think there's no reason why players shouldn't have the flexibility and the and the freedom of choice to, to go to school and play sports where they'd like to. You know, it's funny that the numbers, there's been an increase over the last, you know, three to five years, call it, as far as the number of athletes entering the portal on an annual basis. Or, you know, tra- the portal is relatively new. It's in, you know, the last four or five years. And those numbers have increased. And there's always this kind of like, doomsday rhetoric from a certain corner of Twitter or certain commentators about how, you know, kids these days, they, they can't handle adversity. So they run at the first sign of, of pressure and hardship. And, you know, it's not going to build character. And, and there's th- this whole like kind of old school, you know, the kids these days are not tough enough, they're soft, whatever. And the irony, I think, is that when you look at just college students in general, so forget athletes, these are econ majors, and and bio majors and whatnot, just normal students. The transfer rate for normal college students, I, I don't know it off the top of my head, but it's actually, I think, maybe higher than what the athlete transfer rate is. So just forget, you know, your football players, your men's or women's basketball players, just college students in general. You know, think about those that maybe didn't get into their dream school or their ideal school the first time and maybe went to a two-year school or they went to you know, a regional campus within the Ohio State system, and then they transfer to main campus or whatever school it may be. And so it's one where, you know what, that's, that's sort of just what 19 to 23 year olds do at college in general, right? So now you throw in the chance that these are athletes who maybe they don't have the playing time they want. Maybe their role has changed. Uh, Maybe the school has brought in transfers at their position where someone else transferred in. So you know what, they see a better opportunity going somewhere else. And then, of course, you throw in the new monetary components where they can make money, you know what, either due to their true uh, marketability and marketing skills, or you know what, because they're really dang good at a certain sport and those fans want to pay for that that talent. Either one, there's now chances to make money directly off of, you know what, where they go to school, what sport they play, what position they play within that sport. So, I mean, I, I think it's great. I know it causes problems for coaches fans don't like it and until their school lands a big transfer and then it's all fine. So, you know, it's, it's one where it took too long for what you might call the, uh, you know, traditional revenue producing sports um, to have that, you know, the chance to transfer and then play right away because not all sports have that. People forget that too. Like, you know, and I believe like soccer, you know, it's one where it's, it's a, it's a bigger sport compared to say like a bowling or track and field maybe, but soccer players could transfer and play immediately. Right. And so now it's it's all sports, but it's like a lot of sports that they were already kind of doing this, and coaches figured it out, and players figured it out. So it's it's overdue, I would say. And now 
because I think that um, the NCAA, which of course is just the schools and the presidents within the system, you know, people often say it's, you know, the big bad NCAA when really that just means all the members collectively that make up that group. Um, when they kind of, you know, kick the can down the road as far as some of these issues like NIL and like the transfer portal and, and one-time transfer exemption, is it when these things overlap where players can now play right away and they can make money? If those were spaced out five or ten years, maybe there's not the current, uh, you know, fluctuation and craziness and whatever word you want to use if those are more spread out. But because they weren't, they were reactive versus proactive, that is kind of maybe hyped up all these events where there's now so much change at the same time. And when you can like player movement with earning potential, well, yeah, no doubt it's going to lead to, you know what, the kind of the modern version of college free agency. So I can I can appreciate your you know your your, your thought process just just on that uh, because it, it, it's interesting and I, I think Coach Prime has been the best example of it because so many fans to your point so many fans are frustrated with him leaving right but then at the same time if you were to ask a fan. Okay, if it's in your best interest for you to move out of this state for your family, if this is in the best interest for you to move to a more ideal situation, what would you do? Right. If we eliminate football and the sports and everything like that, the people are going to say they would do what's in their best interest. So I think it's just it's really interesting that people are always upset until it's in their benefit, because for years, coaches have signed players. You know, they sit in people's living rooms. They tell their, their mom, their dad, whoever, you know, I'm here for your son. I'm, I'm going to be here and make sure that we get them everything they need. And then their contract's up. And then they go to another school. So I, I think that's I, I think that's really interesting. I, I just think it's really interesting that as people, sometimes we have to be careful, man, because we always have the best advice for situations that we're not in. It's interesting. No, it's, you know, it's one where um, there's a great line that, you know, CBS is Gary Parrish, he covers college basketball, and he has a great line that he'll drop once or twice a year, and he's saying, you know what, if you are so worried about the 18-year-olds that you don't know, right, these are freshmen at whatever school, about them making poor, you know, quote-unquote, poor life decisions about, you know, transferring or, or turning pro early, whatever, like, their decision is as far as their college or professional career, He's like, you know what, go down to like big brothers, big sisters, or go down to uh, a food shop. Like, if you actually want to make a difference in the lives of teenagers who you don't know, there are so many outlets out there you can actually go and make a difference where it's like, yes, maybe it's unfortunate when you're a fan of of big state you and, and your point guard or your wide receiver transfers, but it's like, yeah, you're right. That's, that's that's their life. You know what? When you when you went to school or when you accept a job offer or consider a job offer, you have all those considerations about you know what distance from family and friends and what can I make and where does it set me up for my career and my future. And it's no different from them. And, and kind of back to my last point too about how some of the rhetoric is like you know the, these kids can't handle adversity or they they're too soft whatever. Um, you know to go back to football, look at what three of the last five or six Heisman Trophy winners have transferred and then become the number one pick in the NFL draft. So Joe Burrow transferred, Baker Mayfield transferred, Kyler Murray transferred. And maybe you could say that other players maybe see those examples that work out and they think, well, hey, it worked for this guy who's now an NFL star who won the Heisman maybe to work for me. And it won't always work out, right? But that's that's any decision in life about, you know, job prospects or whatnot. But there are examples where like, you know, can can we celebrate the the Joe Burrow about okay, this guy fought for the starting job at a, a big state school in his you know his home state was a backup, didn't win it, and then you know transferred, won a different starting job, won the like all. Can we like celebrate that and also for the average guy that's not Joe Burrow also support that decision too? It's just it's a funny dichotomy where you know there's the the Baker Mayfield who's the walk on and goes from Texas Tech to Oklahoma and becomes a first pick like. There's examples of guys that have done that, and fans love it, the media loves it, but then when it's just the anonymous, you know, former three-star that didn't pan out, it's, you know, it's it's doomsday. So I do think that's an interesting interesting framing that um, there often is among, you know, certain members of you know, fan bases in the media. And there's one other person that came to mind that I was thinking about right when you were just talking about, you know, Joe, Bur Joe Burrow and everybody else, Cam Newton. 
Cam Newton Jr. College, and I think he was at the University of Florida before he went. He was to- on. He was, I believe, Tim Tebow's backup is his yeah. true freshman year. So he was he was there on that loaded roster, and things didn't work out. Went JUCO, came back up to the SEC. Yeah. See, it's yeah, it's it 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 it, it makes sense. Okay, it it makes sense. I understand it. Okay, so we. We, we, we talked about Coach Prime briefly. I, I want to bring it back full circle because I because I just saw the article you put out and, you know, you're talking about you, you were talking about people that we need to look out for people that we need to look out for. You're talking about 13 figures specifically to watch in the NIL landscape for 2023. Andy. I looked at the I looked I looked at the article. And with you having Coach Prime first, I think it's very interesting because personally, right? Personally, if we were to measure numbers from before NIL started, and this is my own thought, I think he's done the best job of capitalizing. And then signing as the head coach with Colorado, it put it on steroids. And then this season, we're going to watch things go even more crazy and then I'm not sure if you heard, but he just released a series with Prime, Amazon Prime. There's a Coach Prime series. I, I binged both episodes last night just when it came out. I don't think there's a better example of how to leverage your position than Coach Prime has done. Period. Period. I'm, I don't know. I, I, I don't have a question, Andy. I don't have a question. But I'm I'm just I'm just gonna ramble on this thought a little bit longer, and then you can say whatever you want to say. Deion Sanders, aka well, Coach Prime, aka Deion Sanders. He's leveraged social media to a level that many student athletes haven't even began to tap into. Some have right video. Some are doing podcasts. A lot are doing TikTok. But to the level that Deion. Dion's probably putting out three to four clips a day on Instagram. They have a separate YouTube page, which is the pregame show that they were doing at Jackson State. They have another YouTube page. And then he's even found influential rappers, comedians, to where they're doing videos as if they're signing to go to Colorado with Coach Prime. And these are people with millions of followers. If if you were a football player and you had an opportunity, would you would you not go to Colorado? I'm, I'm done, Andy. I'm done. I'm done. I, I mean, frankly, and I think I agree. And it's almost, and I don't know when you define or how you would define leveraging his position. I think for me, I would agree, but I would define you know his position as being Deion Sanders, because it's not like the position of Colorado football head coach is a big position in the year 2022. Um, You could argue it was was Jackson State a a similar stature, which that might sound ridiculous on face value just based on, you know, how the traditional media covers PWIs versus versus HBCUs, right? But Colorado is at the very low level of the Power Five. And so what he's done is that it's just who he is, right? It doesn't matter what school. It doesn't matter if he's at a different school in three or four years. It'll be the same sort of thing. And maybe eventually if he is at one of those top 10 to 15 jobs nationally, maybe there is an even higher level that, that this coverage and his effect and aura could could become. But I think that's just, that's sort of who he is. Like who, what coach would ever film their introductory meeting with their new players? And I'm not sure if that's a critique. I, I think some of the, the messaging was definitely blunt. But I don't know if that's different when Lincoln Riley was hired at USC, and I think they took advantage of a rule. They they basically kind of ran off, and he's owned up to this, like 25 or, or 30 players where they can still get their scholarship and, and go to school. They just can't be on the team, but they can then replace those players as members of USC. It's just like, you know, really niche rule. And, and so, sure, Lincoln Riley didn't film that, but you could say, okay, when, when Dion goes in there and he says – you know, I've got my own luggage, and it's Louie, you know, he's talking about how his son is going to be uh, the quarterback, like, he says, okay, you know, Shadur has to, like, earn it, but here's my quarterback, who at the time 
wasn't in the transfer portal. So he, he came in talking a big game, but what coach would ever film that, right? And then to put that, not just on YouTube, right? But your own or your family's own YouTube channel, which his son Bucky runs. And then we saw Travis Hunter, who was, you know, like a top two recruit in last year's recruiting cycle, who then when he transferred from Jackson State to Colorado, took a page out of Dion's playbook, has his own YouTube channel. He said, I will commit once I receive or reach 100,000 YouTube subscribers, which is owning his own audio. Like, he didn't go on ESPN. He didn't go on, you know, name your podcast or name your digital show. Like, he literally owned that own content. And I think, you know, he was at maybe like mid to, mid to high 80,000s uh, in terms of subscribers when he put that message out. And then I think when he actually, like, did commit and, and release that video, he was maybe around like 110. And so the direct monetization of YouTube, which you ask, I think probably anyone in media, as far as, you know, YouTube versus Instagram or TikTok or Twitter, YouTube has more monetization, like direct monetization capabilities. And this is a 19 or 20 year old, however old Travis Hunter is, his own commitment led to his own earnings, which is something that surely he probably may, may not have been direct from Dion, but that, that mindset, that thinking like, there's stuff from this whole kind of like 21st century content, modern day social media, the monetization that no one else is doing. And I don't know how many coaches would try it because it would it would take too much time. It wouldn't feel authentic. They have huge staffs at these schools to, to do that themselves. But the ownership, right, where the Sanders family and Hunter, they have their own channels like you mentioned. And sure, the school itself will put out great stuff as well. But it's like the controlling your own message, which as a member of the media can be frustrating for us because we, we want to hear from them directly. We want to have our own interviews. But if you're in his position and you can make money directly off of that and you choose the messaging and, and when and where and how it comes out, you're right. Like no, no one's doing it better or even in the same category, I don't think. And I was watching the, I was watching the documentary on, on Amazon on Amazon Prime, and they were talking about what well, well, Dion said. Co Coach Prime said that when he was talking to the Jackson State team, he was saying, "I'm I'm not looking for one or two of y'all to get NIL deals. I'm looking for a lot of y'all to get NIL." So basically, he was saying, "I'm looking for to get collective deals that positions everyone well," because you know Coach Prime has done many interviews to where he's been saying, "You know, I'm I'm not gonna be the coach of a team to where." players are making more money than me, which, I mean, I can understand that because if, you know, j j j like just as, I guess, the old example, if there's a young child who's making more money than their parents or they're paying the house note, it's tough to tell that child what to do because like, mom, I put this in this house. Like, seriously, what are we talking about? But anyway, I'm... I'm glad you put out the article, and if, if you have not read the article, we're going to have it linked down in the show notes um, so you all can find out more about the 13 figures to watch in the NIL landscape in 2023, okay, 2023. Andy, we, we haven't even talked about you, man. Andy, let, let's, let's talk about you. How did you, how did you get into this, this broadcasting, sports reporting? Like, where, where, did, where did this start? Because I, 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 saw, I saw your old highlight reel. But where, 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 where did all this start? Where did all this start? So I went to Indiana University. I uh, was a journalism major there at the uh, then named the Ernie Pyle School of Journalism. So this is a World War II correspondent. So very much in the traditional journalism mold. Um, that was very much a, a kind of a print journalism focused, you know, school and uh, in curriculum. And then actually my last semester at school, um, IU released basically what's called like the media school. So it's it's broadcasting and it's podcasting and it's really it's just modern media you have to do it all it's social media it's can you write for a website you know on on um maybe no deadline prints on deadline doing all this stuff and uh you know you look up six internships later and i i've made a career of this um and, and really in this kind of like nil and sports business space i took an interest to this really in, in 2020 where with my last job, which was writing for NCAA.com, uh, we were not the NCAA, but we produced content for their website. The company is currently called Warner Brothers Discovery. So Shaq and Charles Barkley were technically distant coworkers of mine at the time. And, you know, this is in the summer of 2020, where we didn't know would there be sports at all that entire 2020-2021 school year, right? 
And if there's no football and if there's no NCAA men's basketball tournament, understandably, it would make sense that why would you have a staff or at least the same size staff to cover sports for NCAA.com if there are no sports? So at the time, there's just there's so much uncertainty. Uh, you know, there was a stretch for shoot three or four weeks, right, where we basically had a live blog tracking what schools and what lower level conferences were basically just like canceling their seasons. And that was sort of like one of my like daily tasks for a month was just tracking, you know what, due to the the new COVID-19 pandemic, this division two conference will not be playing fall sports or this, this school is opting out of football, what, you know, what have you. And so seeing the potential writing on the wall, I was like, I, I need a backup plan. And so at the time I had, you know, still had my, my normal 40 hour week day job, but then I also launched a newsletter on the side where it was covering all the stuff that we weren't going to cover at NCAA.com, which was very much, you know, game coverage, who won, who lost, what's the latest top 25 poll, what is the championship racket for name your sport. But there was all this stuff going on in the world where it was, you know what, it was social justice movements and it was health and safety protocols and, and should these athletes even be playing or under what circumstances, you know, if, if normal students aren't even on campus taking remote classes from their homes, why are the athletes there, right? There's all these kind of like big weighty questions. And this is all still kind of in the pre-NIL era. So there had been some state laws that had been passed that had not taken effect yet, but they were, you know what, months away or about a year away from taking effect. And so it was a lot of also kind of like forward-looking coverage of what will NIL mean and, and how will this shape the landscape? So there's all these other issues. So I had my my day job covering 90 championship sports for NCAA.com. And then on the side, I would, you know, finish my day job and then work on my weekly newsletter where I kind of built an audience from scratch and, and got up pretty close to a thousand subscribers, eventually sold that to a different newsletter called Extra Points. And then from there was doing that. That was my new side gig replacing my last side gig. And then reached out to On3 in the spring and said, hey, you know, I, I see that um, you guys have had coverage of sports business and NIL. This is kind of who I am. This is my background, the interest I have in this space. And so what was really kind of this side hustle, uh, a hobby of mine for, you know, call it two years or so, I wanted to kind of make that my, my primary, you know, full-time day job, right? Where I'm now covering NIL and coaching contracts and game contracts and conference realignment, all this stuff as my full-time thing, which I kind of, you know, had the, the traditional sports coverage background, but then really had an interest in all these other issues that, you know what, um, unfortunately, many of them came about due to the pandemic, but I think they're, you know, it's almost like it's often, you know, they're, they're financial stories or they're health and safety stories, but they come through the lens of sports. You know, it's deep down, we all love the games. We love watching, you know, college football on Saturdays and, you know, name your, your college basketball matchup on a Tuesday night and what have you. But there's also all these other, you know, big picture issues. And so in my role now, you know, when you're talking to immigration attorneys or you're talking to economists and these really, really bright, smart people where you're like, I don't claim to know it all, but if I can find the people that are smarter than me and experts in their field and then bring that to my coverage of NIL and sports business, I think it's a really interesting time in this really interesting space. Man, yeah, I mean, you know, just just, just having, just, just like you're talking about, it seems like it's so vast of what you can cover and being in the space and just like you said, NIL, conference realignments, and have, having all these conversations, I, I I think it's necessary. And the reason I say that is because so often people say, keep this out of sports, right? Just stick to basketball, just stick to football. But that's not how individuals are made up, right? People have passions and and players have different pursuits and other things that, you know, they have interest in. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you cover the content that, that you cover and and bring it all full circle, bring everybody together. Because I think sports and food are two things that will continue to always bring people together, no matter of color, race, creed, religion, beliefs. Put a game on, put some wings in front of it, depending on your audience. I mean, you can put whatever beverage, and then they will come. They'll come. Andy, let's say... We fast forward five years from now, like what is that, I guess, pinnacle for you, for you to say either I made it, I did it. What, what is that thing? What is that level? 
Talk to us. I'm curious. That's an awesome question. Um, yeah, as far as making it, that's that's tough because you know I think back to you know when I was in college or a recent post grad or you know any time you think about okay what's what's my dream job or, or where do I want to be in five years and I look back and like like those answers have changed over time which which is good as they should you know there's nothing wrong with having you know the same goal for for fifteen or twenty years but I know that you know for a while it was like okay I want to become like a national college basketball writer and then like I mentioned is that this other stuff about you know, finances and inequities and contracts and all this stuff. Like I find that really kind of off the field stuff, really interesting. And then how that translates back to impacting on the field play, right? So how, how a roster is created in the NIL era, how do coaches a lot their time and responsibilities in the NIL era? So long story short, I don't, I love what I'm doing now. I don't know what this world looks like in five years, because I think that in five years and, and probably sooner, Athletes will either be direct employees of universities or there'll be some sort of like a contractor or licensee of the schools where the schools are paying them directly. And so to br- you brought this back for full circle. Now it's my chance to kind of bring this full circle. Is it when so many of the current deals out there, there are a lot that are true marketing deals where a business or someone wants a true return on investment or, or quid pro quo of like, I'm going to pay you this and then you do this, some sort of shout out or, or autograph signing, what have you. But a lot of deals, it's because you play quarterback at this big time school, right? And so once the schools and or the conferences are, are paying these players directly, which I think they will maybe as soon as like three to five years, this whole NIL landscape, it'll still exist. Like you're not gonna take you're not gonna introduce these rights and have the Supreme Court say what they've said as far as like the education related benefits. They're not gonna walk that back. But the impact of NIL and the transfer portal and all these kind of big buzzwords and hot button issues, it won't be the same in five years, right? So I don't know, you know, the role now as an NIL reporter, if the SEC is directly paying all their athletes across all their sports, or each school can somehow have a, a cap or, or, you know, Bama and Georgia are now paying their, their players directly from the school, you know, what's what does that NIL landscape look like? If it's truly then just the marketing deals, I don't know. So I think making it, you know what, just keep on hustling, keep on trying to grow my platform, uh, continuing to do, you know, multimedia work. We have a YouTube channel on three that's growing really quickly. And I'm, I'm a very small piece in that, in that cog of, the, of that growth. Um, but I love doing stuff on YouTube as well. I love writing and reporting and joining shows and, and podcasts like yours. So whatever this space looks like in five years, you know, NIL may not mean the same thing. Transferring may not operate in the same way if they're under contract as employees. But whatever covering sports business and these bigger issues looks like in, you know, call it 2028, 20, whatever, I hope I'm in that space. Fair enough, man. Fair enough. So as, as I told you earlier, Andy, I said, you know, the, the premise of the show, we like to, you know, help student athletes succeed beyond their degree. And this now is a new segment that we're doing, and it's called Dear Student Athlete. So if there's a student athlete out there, well, there is, but um, I'm going to give you the opportunity now, like what would be a tip, a word of advice, or just a nugget that you'd like to share with the student athlete? I think the biggest piece of advice that I would recommend, the ball's in your there's nothing wrong with free product, getting free sneakers, a free hat. Um, you see a lot of product deals in like the, the energy drink space or, you know, maybe some sort of like fashion or, or makeup on the female side. But a lot of the athletes who come across to me as the brightest that I've talked to, where they have a, a grand vision, a, a grand plan, um, you know, one in particular, a UCLA quarterback named Chase Griffin. When he talks about NIL, he talks about building generational wealth, right? Talking about like his future kids and their future kids. And I would say as far as the monetary aspect, because there's so much more to NIL than just the, the direct deposit, what does your bank account say? That's a very important part, right? But there's, there's so much, the, the connections, the branding, um, the comfort speaking in front of media or business people or you know pitching yourself to business. Like there's so many valuable things that aren't related directly to how much are you making. But I do think some of the brightest athletes I've talked to they only do cash deals. It could also be equity. If you get stake in a business, that's almost maybe even better than cash, right? Because if you can buy low and you have, you know, 
shares of that company. That's amazing too. But I know that I've spoken to athletes who they don't do, you know what, the one-off, give me a free t-shirt or if they're at that stature, they could potentially get a car deal where they're leasing a high-end vehicle. What if you got that same value, but the direct cash, right? So I do think that there are so many more lessons. So maybe it's a two-part thing. As far as the direct monetization, focusing on cash only or finding ways, can you get equity, right? Or as part of your deal, can you also maybe meet the CEO? Can you get that FaceTime in addition to the cash? But then it, it's, I think, setting goals of what do you want, right? So we have the money side, but then setting that aside, what do you want as far as your goals, as far as like like your resume, right? So forget bank account for a moment, but your network, like what is when you pull up your contacts in your phone, like who's in there, right? Or what does your LinkedIn look like? Because a lot of these, you know, business classes as freshmen and sophomores, you're going to have to maybe build a LinkedIn profile if you don't have one already. So it's setting your goals as far as what do you want? And then when it, it does come time to negotiate and talk dollars and cents, are you prioritizing literal dollars and cents versus, you know, free product? Man, Andy, that was so good. <laughs> that was so good. Wow, uh, man. Great, great, great answer. Great answer. Okay, so now, now we're going we're gonna to transition to, uh, to this other segment, a little bit of rapid fire. I like to have a little bit of fun. Uh, you know, let your hair down a little bit. Um, this is, is the segment called This or That. Right, so I'm gonna ask you two options and you say one or the other. Andy, are you ready? I'm ready, let's do it. All right, here we go. Work hard, play hard. Work hard. Hulu or Netflix? Netflix. Writing or podcasting? Writing. Basketball or softball? Basketball. Button up or t-shirt? T-shirt. Pepsi or Coke? Coke, Coke. There it is. See, that was pretty harmless right there. We just we just rolled it out. And then the way we're going to wrap this show up, I always love to give, you know, give our guests the opportunity to shine spotlight on somebody that they feel is a hidden gem. You know, somebody you've seen out here just really doing doing amazing things, doing amazing work or whatever. But just somebody that you want to spotlight. And this is kind of like a two part thing. It's somebody you want to spotlight and somebody that you're like, John, you should have them on your show next because I think they're doing amazing things. I think they're doing amazing work. I think they're an amazing individual. Who would that person or persons be for you? To keep within the, the NIL theme, and this is someone that I think has had uh, his share of, of notoriety, um, but kind of share the full scale and the impact of this landscape is actually the very first person that I met when I started my job. I think it was June 13th. It was a Monday. Um, I flew from Chicago to Atlanta to cover what was called the NIL Summit. And it was a gathering of probably three to 400 college athletes. Um, not just D1. There was, I know, at least one like D3 receiver that was in town. And it was brands. And there was at least one D1 athletic director. And the first person I met on my job was taking the shuttle from uh, Jackson Hartfield Airport down to, I think it was maybe the Omni in downtown and it's a, a two-sport athlete at Norfolk State. His name is Raekwon Smith. He's a running back and also uh, runs track and field. And it, his nickname is, uh, I believe, the King of NIL. And at the time, Raekwon had, I think, something like pretty close to 70 different brand deals. And this is someone who I had not heard of prior to the, the NIL era. Um, I would assume that, you know, most, most fans at home haven't. Um, but a, a two-sport athlete... And he's someone that basically, based on sheer will and how industrious he is and his business sense, which is clearly growing, is that he's just gone out and sold himself to so many companies that that's how you reach. This is over the summer. So this has been now, what, over six months? And he was at 60 or 70 deals then. And he was selling himself to companies and pitching himself. And you know what? Getting told no a lot because... The, the hit rate on that, you're not going to get every single, you know, brand partner you want, but there's some pretty, like, like East Bay was one of them uh, that stands out as that's a, that's a bigger brand name, right? And so just kind of showing the scope that, you know what, it, it's not just the star quarterback. And when I mentioned, what do you want from NIL outside of just the money? Like the money's great. It's, it's, it's so unfair to like dismiss that because that's, that's how you, you know, feed your family. That's how you pay rent. There's, there's so much good that comes from that. But as far as the, the connections and the business acumen, is that, you know what, 
odds are he's not going to go go pro in either of the sports he plays. It doesn't matter, though, because the connections that he's probably made through those, you know, 60 or 70 plus deals and growing is incredible. So that, that's someone that I think has is, is crushed it. Um, it's I don't know if it's ironic or fitting that that's kind of the first person that I met when I started this job with someone that, you know what, didn't go to Alabama, didn't go to Ohio State, wasn't a household name but probably has as much experience as far as the actual transactions and negotiations and, and selling himself as probably anyone in the country because of what he's done. And just, I believe he does have a representative, but a lot of it's just him, right? And, and he has a, a pitch letter that he'll adjust based on the company and the industry. And it was super impressive that this is someone that I think he was maybe like a sophomore or junior and it has done so much when this, this era is still like so new. And to get, you know call it 60 or 70 deals like in the first year um i I was very impressed so i'm gonna shout out raekwon smith there we go raekwon smith you're gonna be next you're next he's on my list i'm I'm glad you said him he's on my list andy i'm glad you said it uh man but andy i appreciate you man taking the time to 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 share taking the time to uh to to have this dialogue with me please you know let, let let the good people know where they can find you how they can connect with you and you know continue to follow follow your content of course, yeah, I appreciate that, Jonathan. You can find me on Twitter at Andy Witchery. Um, follow us on three dot com. We have like an NIL tab where you can get all your latest news about, you know, what the latest deals. We have a deal tracker where we track the latest deals that we are informed of or find out about. Uh, we track collectives. We track state laws, high school regulations. There's now, as of today, twenty six different high school athletic associations across the country that allow high schools to engage in NIL deals and, and retain their eligibility. So you can find us on there. Find us on YouTube. As I mentioned, we have a growing YouTube channel. If you're a fan of college football, we have some great talents. Uh, J.D. Piquel, Josh Newberg. I'm on there once a week doing our NIL deal breakdown of the week. Um, so I play a very small part in that in that growing channel, but it's a lot of fun. So yeah, Twitter, uh, on3.com, our on3 YouTube channel. And I, just, I can't thank you enough, Jonathan, for having me. Really enjoyed this conversation. And it's just, it's it's so much to try to wrap your head around sometimes, but I appreciate the chance to kind of download and, and talk uh, NIL a little bit. Most definitely. Most definitely. Andy, we're, we're definitely going to gonna stay connected. And uh, everybody watching, if you're watching, then make sure to uh, hit the subscribe button and subscribe to my channel on YouTube. If you're listening, uh, then then feel free to go ahead and, you know, give us a give us an Apple review and and share this with a friend that, you know, could benefit. Uh, because, I mean, the the the, the nugget that, that Andy dropped about the dear student athlete part alone was worth the whole interview. But even outside of that, you know, hearing all the all the great information that, that Andy shared. So. Andy, thank you once again. And everybody out there, uh, thanks so much for, for listening. This is Beyond the Ball, where we help you succeed beyond your degree.